the show is about to start. Thank you for your cooperation. Enjoy the show, and please come back and visit us again. Your home. In the comfort and safety of your own space. When suddenly that feeling of security is challenged. Odd noises throughout your home. A presence making itself known in a terrifying way, followed by a sense of dread and the realization that the sanctity and security of your life has just been compromised. How could this happen? And what do you do now that it's found you and threatened you and those you love? Today, we explore this topic, Haunted by the Crone, with guest and survivor Jason Gowan and celebrity occultist Dan Eckhart, next on the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. I'm not gonna stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural. Perhaps. Maloney, perhaps not. What's the danger of simply speaking the name of a paranormal entity, a demonic force? Can it open a pathway inviting that energy in? But what if you did it as just a joke, not truly meaning to actually evoke something? Is there a chance that you could accidentally call upon the forces of evil? Our first guest knows all too well, and luckily, his family survived this encounter. Jason Gowan is a longtime friend, paranormal investigator, and survivor of a terrifying face-to-face -face meeting with an evil entity, an entity with its eyes set on his small son. Welcome my first guest on the Paranormal 60, Jason Gowan. Hello, Jason. You got you got to walk us through this uh, from the beginning. This encounter truly is one of the most harrowing and frightening stories I've ever heard as a parent. Yeah, honestly, you know, I you know I've been friends a long time, and I have always, you know, I'm a smartass. I you know I'm a jokester. <clears throat> you know, I thrive on sarcasm, and throughout my you know career investigating the paranormal it was always my go-to you know it was something that you know you know i was mentored by george lutz whose family was you know the basis for the amityville horror i toured with him that's what he taught me to use to kind of combat some of this darkness and i forget a lot of times when i'm in the moment that these things take things very literally if they're they're not about the joke they're not going to go for the punchline and I had been doing um, 3D scanning and 3D work with uh, Greg and Dana Newkirk uh, from the uh, Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and the Occult. And I was 3D scanning some of their objects. And we had done... Um, now, wait, what, one second. When you say 3D scanning, help our understanding for listeners around the world that may not be familiar with this technology. What exactly are you doing? So I would take a... Uh, a device called a 3d scanner and we would go around the outsides uh, of each of their uh, reportedly haunted objects and we would make replicas of them to see if the haunting trick carried over into 3d printed versions or replicas basically offspring of the originals and it was kind of an experiment that we you know i worked on with them for a long time and one of the things that we we did was one of their statues called the grown and i had tuned in one of their live streams i had um and i didn't even make the joke per se but i said out loud i almost made the joke to that it could sacrifice my son or come from my son's soul i don't remember the exact words that i used but it was i didn't actually make the joke directly i, I said i was going to but i didn't realize that the statue was in the room and apparently eavesdropping. And later that night, uh, my wife and I were watching television and we heard running back and forth upstairs. And I was like, wow, the cat is really going to, oh. 
and the cat is right here. And I was like, oh, and so are the dogs. And also my son, uh, we only had one son at the time, um, ha- was staying at his grandparents. There was nobody upstairs in our house. And my wife heard it and she said, I need you to go find out what that is. So I got up and I started to walk across uh you know the kitchen uh, and i i stepped in in water and i looked down and there were wet footprints and they were shaped like feet exactly exactly like that all the way uh coming into our uh living space which is where we my wife and i were i turned around and i i followed them and they went they were where they were coming from and they came from our our kitchen door which goes outside it had been snowing I turned the light on. There were no tracks in the snow, but there were definitely wet footprints coming from the door inside the house. Um, Now, now these footprints that you saw, obviously your son's not there. Correct. You and your wife are accounted for. When you went from that room into the living room, it's not like you'd trailed through water earlier in the day. No, we had been, we'd been binge watching Netflix for several hours at that point. So we hadn't left the room at all. Uh, and especially hadn't been outside. Um, nobody had come in, nobody had gone out. You know, we have motion sensor cameras that would have let us know if it had seen somebody coming in. Now, Nothing. it's also important to note that with the crone, this this statue and idol, it it put off a scent to some of the people that experienced it, it's like swamp water, right? Yes. Like, like dirty mm-hmm. pond or swamp water. Yes. So when you see these footprints, what is your initial thought? I didn't know at the time. I, w- I was, you know, just completely trying to figure out where it had come from. You know, you, you immediately your, your brain wants to go to somewhere logical. Is there a leak? How did this get here? But in the back of my head, I'm like, oh, I heard some, something running around upstairs. I hope we're not dealing with another another case of the, the creepy crawlies in the house. Right. And, you know, I had kind of stepped back from doing a lot of the paranormal work once I had a family, I had to step back uh, because, you know, Amityville c- carries a weight with it. And so I I called the Newkirks and they got on a um, call with me, and, uh, a FaceTime call. And uh, I, you know, I'm showing them the footprints. I'm like, what, what is going on here? And Dana remembered that she had, uh, that I had made the joke uh, during the live stream. And she's like, the the crone was in the room and she said, did you, did you check upstairs in the, in the baby's room? And I said, no, and that never occurred to me. He wasn't home. So why would I go up there? I had no inkling. So I headed that way with them in tow on the, on the FaceTime. I found the footprints going up the stairs, wet footprints going up our stairs. And unfortunately heading straight towards my son's nursery. I I need to ask just so we're clear for listeners around the world, tuning into this, the footsteps, they're not little dinky doll or idol like footsteps. It's you're not trying to say that adult adult size footprints. All right. And, And, and on the carpet, they were very clear. Like they were like the wet soles of feet. Like, you know, in the kitchen floor, it spreads out a little bit. Uh, But on the, on the stairs, they were pretty defined. So we get to the door um, to of my son's room. The light is on inside the room. He's been gone since this morning. Um, he's also, you know, not able to get himself out of the crib. He's just a little under two at this point. And I walk inside the room and I follow the footprints and they stop directly in front of the crib in one giant puddle. And at that point, I turned to da- Greg and Dana. I'm like, what? And they they said, you know, I, I kind of think you might have brought her here. And so I, you know, thankfully, as I said, my son wasn't home that night. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we just kind of were like, okay, maybe this was an isolated incident. Let's not, you know, go too crazy with this. Uh, several nights later. After Jason had come home, it had been quiet for a couple of days. There was no issues. And it was like, I don't know, after, after it was like one, two in the morning, we were in bed and 
all of a sudden the lights started flashing in the house and all of our Amazon echoes started answering the same thing. I can't do that right now. I can't do that right now. One after the other, just doing all this thing. And at that point, all the lights went on that were on autom- that were automatic uh, hooked to the Amazon Alexa. And I heard my son screaming bloody murder from his bedroom. I hauled ass up the stairs. I get to the room. I fling open the door. The light is already on again. And I he see him. He's red faced. He's screaming. He points to the corner. I turn and I look into that corner. And Dave standing there was this woman who I can only describe as looking like she fell out of the ring movie, uh, sopping wet, tattered clothes, standing in the corner, just staring. And then she disappeared. I grabbed my son and I got him out of there and he stayed with us the rest of the night. So that when you say this disappeared now, I mean, is it just there one second gone or is it disappeared into a wisp of smoke or, or it just see, it it was, it was kind of like a teleportation in a sci-fi movie. It was just bam, gone. Just like a flash and gone. All right. You've you've dealt with a lot in the yes. paranormal field. You were good Correct. friends with George Lutz, as you mentioned, this surviving father figure from the Amityville horror. Yes. George took this very seriously. He did a lot to try to help protect himself and other people as he progressed in his journey in life. Mm-hmm. And those are all things that he taught me. And so uh, he had given me this uh, this kit with this box and some other things. Uh, to to do uh, a cleansing in the house. And so I did. Uh, I did the cleansing in the house. And at that same time, Dana sent me stuff to do a cleansing outside of the house as well. Uh, it hadn't gotten there yet. So the, like the next night, um, we saw her again outside, but she was off the ground and you could see this, this form flying around the windows also at the back door um we would hear we would hear this banging we would go there would be nothing but um we would hear the banging and then at one point my wife did see her in the back door standing outside the back door yes correct and just staring in correct now you're trying to get in but couldn't your wife prior to this incident was she a believer in the supernatural and paranormal no no, she didn't believe in any of this stuff. In fact, she thought she, her exact words to me were like, I just don't understand how you feel like it's okay to take advantage of people because they're not real. And I was like, oh, well, moving in here will prove interesting for you. And so after this stuff, she kind of had to admit that there was something more going on. Um, she also forbid me from doing any serious paranormal investigation after that because she had, you know, quite literally this thing tried to get our kid and you know i was it irresponsible of me absolutely but but at the time i'm a new dad i'm not used to dealing with this kind of thing like i had never had to be accountable for anybody else in the house before so this was a real eye-opening wake-up call for me as a father that you have to be very careful about what you're saying especially when it comes to this stuff and you know it, well, it took I, us I, a- I I'd like to mention before the angry emails come into me about what a bonehead father move this was. Jay is from the same old school I am, right? Uh, Bill Murray was our leader when it came to ghost hunting. Yes. And you you deal with fear, and I've known Jason long enough to know this. You deal with fear and uncomfortable situations with joking yes. and, and kidding around. And that was the concept. That was He was trying to make light of a very weird, creepy story. And knowing that you had the figure in your house because you were doing the 3D scanning and printing of the replicas, it was the, the humor was in an attempt to just kind of settle everybody's nerves and, and show like, you know, br- false bravado. Is that a, a fair assumption? Yeah. Now, you see these wet footprints. Nothing happens after that night. A couple couple days, couple of weeks later, all of a sudden, all hell breaks loose. You see this being in your son's room. Your son sees this being. He's screaming. Your wife, who is not a believer, sees this being. This thing is zipping around the house, pounding on walls and windows and doors. Mm-hmm. This is a nightmare of epic proportions. Yeah, it was like right out of a horror movie. And, and I... You know, I'm a new dad. I I am not used to having, like, I've dealt with hauntings a long time. You know, I was in the thick of it. You know, the Amityville stuff, when George passed, he left me all that stuff. And so anytime I did a talk about the Amityville horror, I would have repercussions at home. And so I stopped doing that when I got a family because I didn't want that coming home 
as well. But this was a whole other thing. I had never been put in that situation where a sarcastic comment with uh, an entity, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, where it decided it wasn't going to just stay where it was. This was in my house. This was directly targeting a member of my family, an innocent member of my family who, you know, he's a, he's an amazing little boy who just, you know, it, whose security and safety uh, were taken from him briefly because, you know, I didn't know any better at the time. I, I, I had never, you know, I've always had a healthy respect for the paranormal, but like you said, Bill Murray and and Dan Aykroyd, uh, they were the they were where I learned the stuff. And also, you know, George Lutz had always taught me, you know, deal with this with humor. And that's what I did. And, you know, I didn't even fully make the joke. It heard me tell the Newkirks that I was going to make the joke and stop myself. Um, and even that was enough to open the door for it. Obviously, this is, as I said, nightmare of epic proportions. What did you do to finally rid yourself of this crone of this evil entity. Well, once the, the, the kit from Dana came in the mail, uh, you know, she walked us through it. We did a cleansing in the backyard as well. So it couldn't come anywhere near the property. And also, you know, it hadn't, it never got back in the house again. Like we never had any other issues. Once I did the, 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 the box stuff that I was given. And uh, once Dana gave us the stuff for outside, we never had any other issue with it. And it, and it went away. In between the time you called the new Kirks to tell them this had progressed, this thing's out there, it came zipping around, did all that thing that one night. Between that time and the time you got the kit, were there other instances where it was blowing up the house, knocking on doors, ringing bells? Yeah, it was like three days. It was like three years. Like, it took us like three days for this to, for her, for the kit to get from where they live to us. And in the three days between that time, it was not, I mean, you, I was terrified to look out the windows because you never knew where you were going to. Like, I saw it, it was. It was like this white, like transparent whoosh that would like fly by the window. And I've never, you know, uh, I've been investigating since 1998. I had never seen anything quite like what happened when the crone was pissed off. At, she didn't get her, you know, her, her prey or, to, or her, her sacrifice. Uh, the smell, was it, was it accompanying your haunting as well? The swampy, dirty water scent? I never, never noticed the smell. Uh, we never had the smell here in the house. Water, for sure. There, there was water. Well, another one thing I forgot to mention is that um, one of the things that prompted me to call the Newkirks that night in the kitchen is, and one of the reasons I was also worried at first that we had a leak is because water poured from, we have this archway in our, in our living room and it poured from the top of it down like rain almost and in the, in the kitchen. And I, so I had thought a pipe burst and then I was like, there's no pipes above that. So I'm not sure what this is. And that that's when I, you know, upon like reflecting on that, I was like, I need, I need to call the new Kirks. There's, this is just, there's nothing up there that would have caused this. So this, this thing was put to put to rest for you and your family. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, within, you know, it was, you know, five days of sheer, sheer terror, but but it was, you know, after that, we never had an issue again. Obviously, because your child was involved, there's a, a certain heightened sense of fear. But looking at it in hindsight, if your son wasn't part of this mix, do you think it would have still been as terrifying? No, I, I mean, I guess for my wife, yes, I had been, you know, I've been in this situation before, you know, when you are, have dealt with the, the, the Amityville stuff in particular, uh, it, it, you know, it was second nature and I wouldn't say second nature, but I had been accustomed to that kind of thing. Uh, for my wife, whole other story, cause she, you know, she came at this so that this stuff is not possibly real. And then there's, there's this creepy ass woman knocking on your door in the middle of the night, trying to get in your house and take your kid. Uh, so for her, it was a whole other ball game. And like I said, right. she, she was no longer comfortable with me actively looking this stuff out. Well, Jason, thank you for coming on and sharing this story and enlightening people to the dangers of even joking about aspects of the paranormal. Yeah, well, you know, Dave, I'm glad to, you know, help you out anytime, come on anytime. And, and I, if anything, no, anybody else takes away from this is, you know, jokes are all great and, and they serve a purpose when dealing with this stuff. But just make sure that you're using them in the most cautious manner, especially when your family's involved. 
Agreed. You can find Jason along with his partner, Jamie Kaler, on the Parents Lounge on Facebook and YouTube. They have a live uh, video show that they do uh, with other parents and talking about dealing with the day-to-day plight of being fathers and mothers. And you guys can check that out. It's a great show. Thank you so much, Jason. Thanks a lot, buddy. All right. Let's take a dip into the mailbox of the macabre because we've got a story that was sent in an encounter from one of the listeners and uh, following in the footsteps of what Jason just told us. I thought it was interesting to share this tale as well. Good evening, Dave. My experience starts as a dream. I've been told in the past that I have an overactive imagination, which is true. But the vividity of this was like nothing I've ever experienced before or since. There wasn't anything that stood out that day, just a typical day like any other. So I struggled to think of any reason I would dream of the events that took place, or more bizarrely, what happened afterwards. The dream started with me in a large manner. It was a little run down, but habitable. There was furniture scattered around sheets over them, so the place was either just lived in or about to be redecorated and repaired. I was a lot older then and surrounded by people I felt I knew, but I didn't recognize them. I was lead investigator for a team looking into suspected activity taking place in the manor. The investigation was in full swing. I was in the middle of looking through evidence gathered when the medium pulled me to one side. There's an evil here. Do you know what it is? I replied. It's a crone. She's attached herself to one of the investigators. You need to get her to reveal herself, he whispered. I went to the manor library, found a book that told me of a symbol that will reveal an attachment, but the host has to touch the surface that the symbol was on. Also, to banish the attachment by burning white sage in a jar, placing a lid on the jar to keep the smoke in, and once the attachment reveals itself, smash it at their feet, like a holy hand grenade, having to be sneaky and not want anyone to know, especially the host of this crone. I drew the symbol on the back of a door, and I waited. One by one during the night, the investigators went through until the host placed her hand on the doorknob. She fell against the door. An ear-shattering scream followed as a darkened mass manifested into a hooded, wraith-like creature. It continued to screech in pain from being torn from its host. I moved in closer, jar in hand. Now, the medium shouted. I hesitated. I was frozen at the sight of what was before me. If this evil truly exists, do we really want to be putting ourselves in the firing line? In that brief moment, the screeching crone pounced, reached out her hand, and grabbed the back of my neck. I awoke from the dream instantly, and I couldn't move for a few seconds. But what worried me the most was the fact that I could still feel the bony fingers on the back of my neck. The few seconds felt like an eternity. Once the pressure was released, I was able to move again. Shaken by the experience, I've since gone through every rational explanation. Sleep paralysis? Maybe, because I awoke instantly and my body was still dreaming with some kind of involuntary muscle spasm. Well, that seems the most plausible. But I'm not a morning person. It takes me at least an hour to fully integrate into normal society. But this morning, I was wide awake. Coffee was not required. There is a voice at the back of my head that says... What if this thing was a warning? For about six years now, I've seriously studied and investigated the paranormal. I consult for a local team. So what if this is a warning? Something I may have to deal with if I continue down this path. Would the spirit reach out this way? To try to either test or scare me off? It seems... The more you know about the paranormal, the less you truly understand, and strangely, vice versa. Or is it a premonition telling me to be prepared for what I will have to face in the future? It would explain why I was aged, and I felt that I knew but didn't recognize the people I was with. Well, maybe. But next time, I won't hesitate. 
But then there's the fact that maybe it was just a dream. My subconscious telling me what I should try to specialize in or the knowledge that I lack. Either way, it's given me a lot of questions. Being the type of guy that can take a hint, I've now made attachments and possessions a big part of what I'm currently researching, just in case. If you have a story or a question that you'd like to uh, have us address here on the program, you can send me that email, dave at paranormal60.com. That's dave at paranormal 60 Dot com, and I will do my best to answer those and bring on experts that might be able to help us. Our next guest knows a thing or two about evoking and the dangers of calling upon spirits, entities, and dark forces. Dan Eckhart is a celebrity occultist that specializes in summoning, seances, and he and his wife, Kat, teach at the School of Occult Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the show, Dan Eckhart. Dan, Welcome. Thanks for having me, Dave. Pleasure to have you. Uh, you know, this is a weird circumstance. You've heard Jason's story. I <laughs> sent you the email to peruse at your leisure to get a handle on the topic hand tonight. And I'm left with a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. The fact that could an item that is viewed as evil imbue people around it with this supernatural force? We've heard of haunted items and cursed objects, possessed possessions the spirit or entity of something dark bound to an idol. Mm -hmm. Is this, is this just Hollywood machinations or is this something that really exists in the world of the occult? No, it is something that actually does happen. Uh, we see it uh, most recently. There was an example of a group of hikers who found an object in the Catskills mountains that also had a current connection to it. Uh, they brought it home with them and they started to have all kinds of negative paranormal experiences. Um, the possession item, the like to have a physical item that might have something attached to it, particularly seems to remind me of uh, gifting within paranormal circles and paranormal community. And by gifting, I mean in the magical sense of um, walking out into the woods to make an offering to something. Uh, maybe you're making an offering to the Fae, or maybe you're making an offering to Bigfoot, uh, but regardless, leaving an object for this entity, for this thing, and seeing what that thing returns. Uh, folklorically, one of the things we do know is that whatever shows up in that space is then meant to be uh, essentially left there. We say thank you for it, maybe we give another gift, but we don't take that item with us. In terms of folklore, in terms of kind of myth and legend, we know that that can, can open doors to things kind of coming along with, uh, with the object for the ride. I know doing the Holzer Files, we mm -hmm. encountered um, some people that worked in Santa Ria. Mm -hmm. And we were informed that they would go and they would bring tokens that they would kind of affix their worries, their anger, their, their frustrations and problems to, and leave it behind, kind of leaving it to nature to deal with yeah. that negativity in a way to purge. Yeah. Um, this being and what happened to Jason uh, truly goes down, especially because I guess he's such a dear friend of mine to know this actually happened to somebody I love, know, and trust. This was something powerful, Dan, but was it mm -hmm. truly this, demonic entity or what do you think took place in that case yeah that's a great question you know when we talk about invoking or evoking spirits when we talk about summoning spirits a lot of people do their mind goes immediately to hollywood and they think about uh demons in a house that have like a powerful name or uh these kinds of um, portals that open to very negative spaces and whenever something comes into our house that's not welcome there the experience is negative uh, it can be very disconcerting. It can be very uncomfortable. Um, but generally, it's harder to summon a, uh, a named demon. Uh, when you're doing occult work that summons an angel or a demon, um, that involves a lot of planning. It often involves multi-day rituals. It involves fasting. It involves a certain order of candles, sometimes even attire, like wearing a crown or using a, a wand or an athame. And those entities seem to be very specific about how they're summoned. So they won't show up unless you have the things that they say you need to have. Um, however, that doesn't mean that lesser things don't come wandering through and filling that space. 
So often when Kat and I are called in for a paranormal investigation or we're consulting on something, what we find is it's one of these sort of like um, non-housebroken, less welcome entities that maybe you make a joke, maybe you say, oh, well, sure, it can come into my house. And then whatever that lesser thing is floating around outside says, ah, an opportunity and walks across the door. Uh, the good news about that is they are generally easier to get rid of than something that requires heavy ritual binding or some sort of a, a cultic grimoire to deal with. But that doesn't mean it's less scary. That doesn't mean it's less uncomfortable. In this instance, as you mentioned, you know, just by simply saying the name doesn't mean that that's going to call that being. But does it turn a light on? Does that being become aware of you? I know that's a fear a lot of people yeah. have listening to shows like this, watching TV shows and hearing demonic names. Does it really grab the attention or does it take the full invocation, the full commitment to this for these things to really take place? It takes the full invocation. Uh, just hearing the name, just glancing at if you were for, for some reason to walk across an open lesser key of Solomon and see a sigil, that will not summon that entity into your space. It takes intent. Um, whenever we do an occult working or ritual working, will is a very important part of that. So you need to have the will to summon the, the uh, entity, the will to bind it, the will to contain it. Uh, however, when we're working in the paranormal, when we're working with this sort of extra physical weirdness, uh, it does seem to attract certain types of people. And it does seem to attract people who are very interested in this sort of thing. So I would say it's less that those entities will show up, but there are those curious ones, those things that are, again, just kind of like wandering through. Um, and when you look at uh, when you look at specifically folklore, like folkloric magic, when you're looking at uh, Hindu and Tibetan uh, magical systems, they're keenly aware, the practitioners of those systems are keenly aware of the fact that there are spirits just floating around. And so they introduce very simple things to stop those things from attaching themselves or coming into a space where they're unwelcome. And a lot of paranormal investigators, a lot of mediums come up with these things kind of, um, kind of intuitively. I know a lot of mediums who do not do a lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, but instead have a very keen meditation system they follow or a very specific set of um, a ritual like washing their hands or uh, not bringing the clothes they wore to a site inside their house with them until they've washed them. That is a ritual and that is effective against these kinds of lesser beings that are just here to cause trouble. Now, I, I do want to point out one thing, as I mentioned mm -hmm. at the beginning of this, that you and your wife teach at the Occult School of Sciences, right? Um, the School of Occult Arts. S School of Occult Arts, I'm sorry. Yes. The word occult sometimes takes on a, a much darker connotation. It uh, it's misunderstood or misrepresented. So people understand you're not, you know, the new, uh, you know, Aleister Crowley who's right. calling upon dark en energies. Yeah. Just give us an encapsulation of what does the occult and study sure. of that art really mean? So the occult art or occult studies, the word occult simply means hidden. And when we talk about the occult arts or occult studies, we're talking about occult philosophy. So hidden philosophy, uh, this goes back to Gnostic thought. Uh, it does include magic. It includes anything that was kind of suppressed as far as uh, religious systems, specifically ones involving spirits are concerned. So all that means is hidden. Um, and I do want to clarify, too, when I say demon, I don't necessarily mean, you know, red devil horns. I mean that in a kind of a, a Greek sense. A demon was essentially any entity that we could not see. Uh, angels, as we have pictured them with fluffy white wings, were also considered to be demons. So that term itself can be a little bit scary. Um, but this simply means hidden. And I simply mean when I say demons, I'm talking about anything that is beyond our sight that seems to have a will of its own. You talked about the importance of intent, and mm -hmm. we've talked about that through the years with Darkness Radio, and yes. and uh, I'm sure we'll be taking that further here on the Paranormal 60. Was Jason an easy target because the totem, the item itself was there in his home as he jokingly spoke those words? I think... I don't want to say an easy target because I think that's unfair because we, we do bring in these things. Like I have a collection of items which uh, come from me from investigations or just uh, 
magical items that I've come to like. Um, but it does uh, create the kind of affinity that's necessary. So if Jason were to say like, oh, you know, uh, something that he might have heard, a, a spirit or a, uh, something like, oh, that spirit shouldn't come and mess around with my family. Well, that probably wouldn't trigger anything. Uh, that's like a bravado. It's a just, um, you know, it is that humor that uh, Lutz talks about, that uh, kind of diffusing an uncomfortable situation. But the fact then that the mind is occupied uh, with these reproductions, that the mind is occupied with these um, spiritual objects, that creates a kind of thought link for whatever came through the door to kind of glom onto and say, I'll be that. That's the easy thing for me to kind of bring into uh, bring into being. So I don't think the entity that he saw in his, his uh, child's room was the actual crone, whatever that may be. Uh, what I do think was that was something that was um, using his kind of uh, his his uh, all the, his focus, his imagination, uh, like the scene yeah. in Ghostbusters yeah. when they're supposed to call upon the Great Destroyer, and they're all keep your minds blank, and Aykroyd can't help but think of the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. Exactly. So, because exactly. this was the thing that was most recent in their minds, the work, the history, the story, this thing took on that guise yes. in order to intimidate. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and that's really uh, what we find with these kinds of situations is that when something that is a lower level entity, whatever it is, if it's a thought form, a tulpa, or if it's actually something that we don't know its name, uh, comes into a space, it does want to make you upset. It does want to rustle your feathers because that energy, that connection, that fear, the more you think about it, that's feeding it. It's making it stronger. Mm. Um, now, that being said, that doesn't mean you can't get rid of it. Jason clearly did. But that's why they are such a disturbance. If people are concerned and worried, mm -hmm. and that's their intent to have fear, mm -hmm. does that invite... See, I've, I've joked around about it with Jeff Belanger for years. We're the ghosts that are not going to be demonic, but if I know you're afraid in a haunted location, yeah. I'm going to be the one pushing the planchette to spell you're going to die. It doesn't <laughs> mean I'm a demon. It doesn't mean I'm evil, right. but I've, I'm a, a wise ass in life. So in death, mm -hmm. right? So this would be something I would do as a joke, mm -hmm. uh, but it does, it, it opens opportunities for lower level energies and prankster ghosts to have a little fun. Exactly. And that's not to diminish the experience. It was terrifying yeah. what happened to Jason and his family and their, the idol was there in their home. So there's a very good chance that whatever it was, was attached to that or some, one of its minions, perhaps mm -hmm. taking on this guise to, to challenge. Um, that in itself is, is terrifying, but yeah, that's why education and schools like you and, and your wife run are important so that people can understand what they're dealing with and how to deal with them appropriately. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And it is very simple. Um, one of the easiest ways to gain control over any kind of uh, entity, demon, whatever you want to call it, is simply to know its name and then to act as though you are in charge of it. Now, you might say, well, that's easy if you know exactly, like, if you know the name. Uh, however, there is a long history within um, exorcisms of the medium, the priest, the person who is presiding over the exorcism, if the entity does not give its name, to simply name it, to say, I, by the power of whatever God you believe in, name you X, and as such, you have to leave. Uh, and that's actually quite effective, because what it's showing is that you are in power. Uh, a lot of these kind of demonic entities, even angelic entities, they have a relationship to power and a relationship to you within that power. So if you can stand within a space and say, listen, I know your name, that entity may wonder what else you know. So it's going to listen to you. Fascinating stuff. Um, people that are interested in taking classes, learning mm -hmm. more about what you and Kat do, the Eckharts.com, is that the best way to reach you? Yes, the Eckharts.com. Uh, the School of Occult Arts is our portal for if you're interested in magic, esoteric philosophy, history, and as well as like safe practice with uh, summonings or uh, just magical craft in general. And then we also, of course, provide readings, but that's on our website. And you can find that by clicking around. The Eckharts.com. T-H-E, 
E-C-K-H-A-R-T-S.com. We're going to have a link for that on today's program guide so that you can find it a little bit more easily. And uh, again, it's always a pleasure catching up with you. Um, please yeah. give my best to Kat. I know she couldn't be with us tonight. She's a little under the weather. Our thoughts and prayers go out to her as well. So thank you so much for being here, Dan. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the insights. It's fascinating. Our concepts are constantly challenged in this field of the supernatural to understand what it is that we may truly be up against. And the paranormal is nothing to be taken lightly. With the popularity of paranormal TV programs, I understand more than anybody people wanting to experience things for themselves. Curiosity, after all, is human nature. When I'm asked advice for new investigators, I always suggest reading, education, and knowledge before investigating. Remember, watching shows on TV doesn't make you an expert in the field. If that were the case, I'd be a lawyer with a medical degree by now, thanks to Law and & Order and Grey's Anatomy. Stay tuned. We've got more coming your way. You're listening to the best in paranormal podcasting. This is the Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. All right, my friends, in my new experiment of terror, I decided to take some of the people I love most and subject them to horror movies they may never have heard of or may have missed in the past. This is upon further review. And I knew I wanted to come out swinging. So there was only one guy I knew I could lean on to check out this first movie. And he came to me. He said, Dave, if we're going to do this, I want a classic. I want one that is going to blow my mind. And I knew exactly what I needed to uh, bring to this. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Belanger, my first vic- uh, first guest on Upon Further Review. Jeff, should we give the, the viewers and listeners just a little taste of the cinematic treat that you just got a chance to watch? Oh, oh I'm sorry, Dave. Am I wasting your time? Because you <laughs> wasted mine. I find that hard to believe. We are far from even, but yeah, go ahead. Give him a taste. All right. I'll I'll call him back. What happened? That night science made its greatest mistake. What unknown terror was born that night. What is the terrifying mutant that strikes from behind the shroud of night? That night. That night of the Lepus. A night of total terror. More shattering than your strangest nightmare. What caused the unnatural death, destruction, and panic that night of the Lepus? Janet Lee. Stuart Whitman. Rory Calhoun. And Paul Fix, Night of the Levis, kill one, and thousands take their place. What devil creatures growing weight and size every day are hidden behind the eyes of horror? What can stop them? Night of the Levis, from MGM. I absolutely love, first of all, that he says mutant in the. <laughs> he also said lepus, and in the right. movie they say lepus. So, mm-hmm. I mean, mutants, mutants. I don't know. This is just a way to try to confuse and confound, I believe. Which is critical if you're the pro- production company that's promoting this movie, because if you tell them what it's really about, no one would have watched it all. What? 
What? Are you kidding? Jeff, in the pantheon of legendary terrifying creatures, we learned from Monty Python that this is one that should not be overlooked. <laughs> so here's the thing. Uh, a couple of things. We have to put this movie into some context. It came out in 1972. 1972. Mm -hmm. uh, William F. Claxton directed it. Uh, not that you should really know that name, but he did like four episodes of The Twilight Zone, two episodes of Perry Mason, and a bunch of Westerns. And so he got some of his Western buddies and actors together, including, by the way, I got so excited opening the watching the opening credits, DeForest Kelly, Bones McCoy. There he is, Bones yeah. McCoy from Star Trek. And I was so excited. I said, all right, I'm in for a treat. I was wrong, <laughs> but, uh, and, and then I had to remind myself, 1972, Star Trek was done and no right. one would ever speak of Star Trek ever again if you're in the 1972 mindset because right. syndication hadn't really happened yet. Um, so Bones McCoy was just looking for a gig, looking for a job, <laughs> which is evident. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I do think it's funny that they they have all of these other celebrities listed. Janet Lee. Look, Janet when you've got Lee. Janet Lee and DeForest Kelly in your lead roles. Yeah. You've got to think this is going to be big. This, this is, this Janet Lee is hot off psycho. Well, 10 years hot off of psycho, but uh, DeForest Kelly, just a few years off of Star Trek. This, this is bound to be a cinematic horror classic, Jeff. So I'm, I gotta be honest with you. I'm a little disappointed in your initial vibe of this movie. Okay. Janet Lee, who, by the way, would go on to be the mother of Jamie Lee Curtis. So uh, more horror connections. Anyway, when the movie first started, uh, also, let me just preface by saying I was an English major. I've written books, right? Bunch of them. I know words. Words are my thing. Lepus, lepus, whatever you want to pronounce it, eluded me. I thought it was some made up monster. Turns out uh, it's the Latin word for hare or rabbit. And the movie was originally supposed to be called Rabbit. But the uh, the movie company figured that didn't sound scary enough. And then it occurred to me, if I had to list all the animals like Noah's Ark, right? Two by two, from scariest uh, to least frightening, right. scariest, we could argue about like crocodiles and alligators and lions and tigers and bears and badgers and or all kinds of things. But I got to believe near the very end would be bunny rabbits. <laughs> I love if you're looking behind us uh, for the visual of this. It says, based on the novel, The Year of the Angry Rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, maybe they should have not read that book. Uh, I don't know. It, so it, here's one of the things. When the movie started, I was giving it a solid one to one and a half phantom review out of five, out of a okay. possible five. I was thinking one to one and a half. I was like, Schrader, what have you done? You've stolen part of my life. <laughs> And the premise, by the way, is that there's a rabbit problem and they try to solve it through science. Mm -hmm. And so they tinker, they tinker and they think, well, maybe we can like genetically modify these creatures and they won't be this big problem for this ranch. They were wrong. Dead wrong. Ooh. So that that's sounds it. chilling. That was good. It does sound chilling, but then you start watching it <laughs> and, and you and as it unfolds, the effects are anything but special. And the actors look so awkward. And it, I realize these are Western actors and, and they know the premise. And I'm sure they're doing some of these scenes and they're looking at the director. They're looking at, at William F. Claxton and saying, I don't know, Bill, this doesn't feel <laughs> like it's going to work. And Bill's, I know, must have said a thousand times on the set, don't worry, in post, it's going to be amazing. We've got some, some stuff going. So for the first like 45 minutes of the, of the film, I have a... <laughs> I can't even call it that movie a thing on my TV. I, <laughs> it's going. I and believe like, cinematic classic is still out there for you to use. Should you choose to? Sure. But we'll get to that. So uh, I'm giving it one and a half phantoms for the first 45 minutes. And then uh, as, as the plot thickens, dissipates, vanishes, and it gets weirder and weirder into crazy town, and 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 obviously they're committed to the whole premise now. You can't turn back halfway through the movie and go, you know what? Let's just toss this out and try again. Uh, I started rooting for it to just get stranger and more corny and more awful. And boy, at that point, I was not disappointed. When I was rooting <laughs> for the bad, when I was rooting, when I said, "Come on, let's let's get worse and worse and worse," it said, "Jeff, hold my beer," because we are going to do just that. 
<laughs> and so my my s- score scale started to slide up. I found because what? I didn't turn it off. I right? kept I kept with it. One and a half fandoms suddenly turned into like three and a half, maybe even almost four by the very end when I was rolling on the floor at laughing at this quote horror movie that was uh, scary in only one aspect, but not the aspect anyone was going for. Truly, truly awful. Uh, But in the end, I will say this, this movie asked some big questions about what happens when we play God, when we tinker with the food chain, when we tinker with, with the animal kingdom. It asks big, big questions. Doesn't answer any of them. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but boy, howdy. This thing could have been pulled out of today's headlines. Except uh, maybe like the scientists would be like, hey, I have an idea on how we can solve this, this wabbit problem. And someone said, no, 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 no. Have you, have you seen this movie, Night yeah. of the Lepus? And that would have been the end of that. What a shame. Well, we are on the 50th anniversary of Night of the Lepus. Oh my gosh. And I'm just hoping, I'm just hoping that somebody has the forethought to come back and redo this movie the way it should be done so that we can see things like this, the <laughs> night of the Lepus Happy Meal. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll say this. I think uh-huh. what happened here's, I'm just guessing I'm spitballing here. I think someone, uh, someone sold the director, the producers a bill of goods. They said, no, 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 no. We can shoot things tight. We can make models. We can do things that will blow people's minds. They will think they are really in to this horrific thing. And then they got a bunch of pet bunny rabbits that look just like the pet bunny rabbits you've ever seen and, and cuddled and, and, and hugged and stuff uh, into the movie. And, um, and when you, and, and you know, it's bad. I'm not an editor or director, but when you see the same scene, uh-huh. <laughs> like five, six times. Sure. Like, oh, like the same like stampede scene. Like I'm like, oh, they, that's that's like the fourth, fifth time they've shown that one. Hey, but they did reverse the film, so it looked like they were coming from different areas. <laughs> right. <laughs> I don't think they actually reversed it. I think they no. kept it to the point where you're like, oh, this happened an hour ago. Oh no, now it's now. Oh, I see. I see. They only they, it was it was hard. You know what? I mean, they had a Herculean task, uh, mm-hmm. and, and someone. But what's great to me is someone read the script and said. No, 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 no. We can pull this off. We could do this. And uh, and I just wish I had half that person's confidence. <laughs> this is like, would you put this in the vein of of like plan nine from outer space? Like oh, Ed yeah. Wood's dream vision? Yes, absolutely. Um, this same thing. And then uh, I just wonder, you know, Bones McCoy, as he went on to really, I mean, you can't, I, I couldn't look at the movie. And every time he came on screen, I was just like, it's Bones McCoy. There's going to be some little like hit nod to Star Trek or something. But then I had to remind myself like, no, 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 no. That was in his past and was going to stay there at this point. For at um, least five more years, not till least, 77, right? Right. 77 is when it, it started to blow up again. And then he really couldn't be anything but Bones McCoy. But uh, but boy, he did this one. I, I think this is one he might like to have back. <laughs> <laughs> this but is the one that got away from him? It's but it's what's great is like it's just so wonderful in its awfulness that you can't help but root for Crazy Town. And when you go in with that mindset, when you go in saying, "Show me just how bad a movie can be," grab your popcorn. You're in for a thrill ride. See, I want people to realize the grandeur of this as well because I set Jeff off to watch this movie, you did. and I got a text, and he's like, "Dear God, what have you gotten me into?" Then a few minutes later, it's. DeForest Kelly's in it. I'm all in. <laughs> and then like every 15 minutes, I'm getting an update. And you did seem to thoroughly enjoy the process of this movie, though. I did. It took me it took me on a, from one place, which was uh, someone someone made this and then someone saw it and someone released it like someone from the movie company said, oh, yeah, yeah, we're putting this out. Uh, and then I realized, like, you know, in the in the canon of bad film. Uh, and, and I looked, I did some research after, you know, just to learn a little bit more about it. Uh, it's made the top 50 bad movie list uh, consistently uh, well-deserved. And um, <laughs> it, it's uh, very few it, things live up to the hype nowadays, folks. This one does lives up to the hype, man. It really yeah. does. But yeah, no, a- after a while it was, it was like, and I found myself like MST three Kang the whole thing, like, like giving my own, having my own entertaining time, just being like, Oh, here it comes. And then just adding my commentary. I got to believe if you got a group of friends around 
and something to alter your state of consciousness, whatever that may be, whatever you prefer, uh, be it liquid form or smokable, whatever, uh, you, you could have a lot of fun for a solid 85 minutes. We should figure out some little movie theater that we could rent around Easter, and this will be our horror <laughs> Easter film. <laughs> <laughs> we invite everybody to come in. We'll do some talks about the paranormal and then just drop right into Night of the Leap. And I love that MGM, like when they put it out on Blu-ray, there was a huge press release and push for this a few years ago. So finally I, available on uh, Blu-ray. Finally. When I saw, you know, I got to be honest, when I saw the trailer, I only watched it online, the original trailer, which is the same except now it says available on blu-ray that sort of blew my mind that that yep. but think about it uh they don't care why you watch it laugh at it laugh with it be scared don't be scared if you're buying it they're still making money well get done your, mgm get your kids together get the family together for fun this easter you're always looking for a good horror movie for the time of year pop in night of the lepus and yes that was the original trailer and i love the echoey voice effect that they used and it's a uh, they are mutants <laughs> in the <laughs> night critical. of the lepus. I promise you, had they shown scenes from the movie, the actual lepus, uh, no one would have gone. They wouldn't have sold a single ticket. They would have been like, are you kidding? That's supposed to be scary. I, well done. Whoever cut this trailer, um, you saved it from being a complete you know, uh, economic disaster for the movie company. Well done. All right, that's it from Jeff Belanger. Thank you, Jeff. We'll be back again next week with another edition of Upon Further Review. Well, I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Uh, great, fun movie. Again, if you just like having fun and schlock fests, check out Night of the Lepus, Lepus, whatever the hell it's called. It's well worth your time to, uh, to look at. Hey, I want to mention real quickly, I'd love to meet you. And it's going to be real simple because coming up March 4th through the 6th, I'm going to be in Waynesboro, Pennsylvania at the Mystic and Mystery Weekend. It's a meet and greet, paranormal investigations. There are tattooers, vendors, Akashic readings, scrying, Reiki, psychic and tarot, readings, runes, aura photography, table tipping, meditation, and more. And I'll tell you what, I have been to a few places that do table tipping. And that is insane to see happen. Now, I've seen bad table tipping, and I've seen remarkable table tipping, where the table is literally lifting off the ground and chasing people around the room. When they get it going, I, I don't know if it's psychic imprint from the people running it or what. Uh, I don't know what kind of shenanigans and black magic is involved, but it's always fun. Again, you can find out more information about that. Go to darknessevents.com darknessevents.com and you'll find more information there on all of the great places I'm going to be this year and I hope you'll check it out before we say goodbye though I want to uh, go by the book well that's our new segment go by the book and this is a great one I love time travel and today we're highlighting the new book time travel the science and the science fiction by Nick Redfern available now via visible ink press fact or fiction real or impossible Movement through time explored, examined, and explained. Albert Einstein's theory of relativity postulates that scientists have proven some of these factors may exist, and that the faster you travel, the slower time moves. Clocks on airplanes, satellites, and rockets are slower than clocks on Earth, and time travel is indeed real. Can time machines, time tunnel wormholes, or tales of fictional time-traveling heroes be so far-fetched? Covering the history of time travel in both reality and fiction, time travel, the science and science fiction, investigates the long history, myths, science, and stories of movement from the present to the past and into the future. Timely in its telling, Time Travel, the Science and Science Fiction by Nick Redfern chronicles more than 30 instances and accounts and stories and famous examples of time travel. You can find that book and more at theparanormal60.com, theparanormal60.com, and then click the store tab. You'll find information there. Well, folks, I hope you enjoyed our first presentation of The Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. The paranormal is nothing to be taken lightly. 
Like any study, time and effort needs to be put into research and understanding. Calling on forces that you don't fully grasp, even in jest, can result in unseen dangers. It's always a good idea to be cautious about this work, but never walk in a place of fear. That's something that can invite lower-level entities seeking you harm to get in and find a crack. Be careful. Enjoy the paranormal. Educate, enlighten, and, and study these things. Because again, you should never walk into this blindly. I'd like to thank our guests, Jason Gowan, for sharing his terrifying experience, and to Dan Eckhart for his guidance and insights. And a special thanks to Tim Dennis. The beat goes on, brother. Make sure to continue to listen to the long-running paranormal podcast, Darkness Radio, and tell them Dave sent you. And finally, to Bart L. for the Paranormal 60 theme and Dan Masnick for the great graphics he continues to create for me. And Winnie Schrader, my wife, for social media, website maintenance, and all the hard work, love, and support behind the scenes. And thank you all for visiting the Paranormal 60 and allowing me along on your journey. May the darkness be a little more light with the information we shared here. Stay safe and be kind. We only have one now to get this life right. Make the best of it.